uh, to introduce Lara Majolsnes, who is a senior lecturer at the University of California, Irvine, in the Department of European Languages and Studies. She's also the Director of Program in, Ro in Russian Studies. She received her PhD from the University of Southern California in Slavic languages and literatures. She teaches interdisciplinary courses on Russian and Soviet cinema and on the history of Soviet animation. Lauren Michelle recently published the book entitled She Animates, Soviet Female Subjectivity in Russian Animation, which I highly recommend, with Academic Studies Press in 2020. A Russian version of this book was released in 2023 by the Sobremenia uh, Zapadnaya Rusistika <laughs> is that <laughs> in St. Petersburg, Russia. I think I I think I uh, got got a lot of words there mispronounced, but um, but I'm just so excited uh, to to be kind of going back to some childhood memories today. <laughs> So um, I, you know, I've never done a uh, a paper on the process. So I hope I, I hope I, I, I don't do too much of the process, but we'll see. Or that my my version of how I write is uh, is not uh, interesting. Um, but I think one of the things that's um, important to start with is that um, I am a senior lecturer, um, and this means we actually don't have any. Um, uh, research requirements uh, as a senior lecturer. Um, and I even say, I mean, I don't want to say that that we aren't um, necessarily encouraged, um, but it makes no difference uh, to our sort of uh, promotions, right, whether or not we research um, or not. Uh, so I think maybe my approach is maybe different than than some people, or maybe not. I'm, I'm not really sure. I fell into writing uh, about animation uh, after working on my dissertation on children's literature. Um, and uh, one of the first classes, of course, I taught at the university was on uh, Russian children's literature. Then I taught a class on uh, Russian folklore. And so, you know, I sort of revolved around a lot of these uh, themes. Um, but I think I, actually my primary interest in examining animation actually came from an article that I just happened to read um, when I was writing my dissertation on children's literature about children viewing Russian films in the 1910s, right, before um, there was actually, um, you know, films for children. Uh, and this is actually what made me sort of say, oh, you know, well, okay, there weren't, weren't children's films. When did children's films uh, start? Uh, and even before I, I had started writing about animation, I started putting a class together um, for undergraduates, um, sort of a general education course that would be taught, you know, across um, the, uh, you know, the university. Um, and uh, I was interested in teaching it because I had had great success with children's literature and folklore classes. Um, but then when I started uh, to put the syllabus together, I realized that there was really very little scholarship out there um, in English uh, that my students uh, could read. Um, and of course, I also noticed that um, there was a lot of connections between uh, folklore and children's literature, and it felt it made me feel a little more confident um, about, uh, you know, uh, writing about and teaching animated films, um, because more or less, um, I, you know, I'm a Slavicist, I'm not a film historian. Um, and so, you know, that was sort of a, 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 a particular, you know, direction that I wasn't necessarily 100% sure, oh, is this, should I, should I be doing this? Is this something um, that <laughs> is uh, important to me? Right. Um, so, uh, you know, my very first film, um, my very first animation paper that I gave uh, was on films from the 1980s. Uh, and I was sort of looking at uh, how the representation of childhood uh, changed in these films. Uh, and I was looking at, uh, I was I was working on two different films, um, uh, but one was by Natalia Golovanovna. And um, this was of course my, my first sort of look at a female director, but I at that point didn't even think about um, female directors uh, as such. Um, so a little bit, let's see, can I make this go forward? Yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> so I guess one important part of how I actually get things out and, and write um, is that um, I have to carve out deadlines for myself. I'm sure everybody <laughs> does this, but because I, uh, you know, I, I, I 
don't get any, I, I mean, I'm not supposed to research, right? <laughs> um, uh, I really do arrange a lot of my papers by going to uh, conferences. I need to make a way to engage myself in uh, research. Um, and um, of course, I bring all of my, my research into my current classes uh, and discussions with my students. And so I think this does make it a, a sort of a richer learning environment for everyone. Um, but presenting at conferences has really given me a way to um, not only deadlines, but to turn out chapters and articles, but also to interact with other scholars in my area, which I think has been very important for um, this uh, writing process. And even though I do attend a lot of national conferences, uh, I've gotten a, just as much or even maybe more out of regional conferences, local conferences, um, but I'll come back to conferences um, in a second. Um, one other thing that is actually the process of, of writing um, is a venue that uh, at my university they have, it's called UCI Write, and it's a faculty writing initiative. Uh, and the idea here is to bring faculty together across campus who want to support each other in writing. Um, and you can see us writing here during the actual pandemic, right? They gather us in a big room uh, and we sit there for basically, I don't know, six, usually six hours. Um, you know, there's coffee breaks, there's all of this, um, but this is, a, it's really an interesting way to watch other people write. And it, it encourages it encourages you to, um, to write again, uh, write also, so um, it can be done on a very small level. These usually are like 30 to 50 uh, people, but I also meet, do this on a smaller scale as well. I meet a, a friend at a local coffee shop and I write um, together every week. Um, and for me, this actually physical writing in a group either one-on-one -on -one or with a larger group um, is really important because I'm someone who gets very distracted by email, course prep, dishes, right? And so having this uh, place to uh, write um, is, uh, is really important uh, for me. The other thing I would say that, uh, you know, is important for me as uh, as a writer is that I think one of the largest motivations for writing comes from my colleagues. Personally, I have discovered a lot of ideas uh, for writing uh, topics from attendances at conferences and from books and articles from other people uh, in my field or from adjacent fields. Um, and so I'm first gonna talk a little bit about writing, the writing of She Animates, right? A female Soviet subject subjectivity in Russian animation. Um, and I thought I would talk about this first because I co-authored this book with Michelle Lee, um, and uh, um, which came out, as we know, in 2020, and the Russian version just came out in 2023. Um, and one of the reasons I want to talk just a little bit about this book is because it did lead to my current research on Ukrainian uh, animation and actually other voices too. Um, so uh, the first idea for this book uh, came from the Society for Cinema and Media Studies Atlanta Conference in 2016. I was actually attending uh, with Michelle. Um, and uh, she is a, a Russian and film as uh, a Russian and Soviet film historian. Uh, so one of the nice things I think about our book is that we have a Slavicist and a uh, film historian, and we work together uh, to bring the book um, together. Um, and uh, so you know, we attended a panel there by uh, Lydia Kaganovsky. She is now at UCLA on ways of seeing a, was there a Soviet women's uh, cinema? Uh, and during her talk, she actually made a quick comment about the fact that the number of live action women filmmakers in the Soviet Union were very few in comparison with animated films. Um, and I had already been teaching my, <laughs> my um, animation class for about 10 years at this point. Um, and I listened to and I was thinking I started going through my syllabus and I was like, Oh, yeah, that was by that was directed by a woman. Oh, yeah, that was directed by a woman also. Um, and so I would like to say that I continued to listen to <laughs> Lilia's uh, presentation, but I got sort of caught up in making a list of all of the uh, all of the uh, women directors that I had been teaching, but had never sort of put the dots together. That yes, there are a lot of um, female uh, uh, directors in uh, Soviet uh, animation. Um, uh, and, you know, when I got out, I sort of opened up my computer and I went through, uh, you know, my class notes and my papers that I had given and I had and I had worked on 
um, you know, presenting various, uh, uh, you know, animation uh, papers at, at various conferences. I had presented on Ziga Werther. I had uh, presented on the Bloomberg sisters. I had presented on Yuri Neustein. I had presented on um, Ivan Vana. Vana. Uh, I had presented on all of these, and I'd actually turned some of them uh, into articles. Um, the Werther article was published. Uh, the Vana, uh, Vana paper was published. And I was like, wow, this is sort of curious. I published um, my my work only on men, right? <laughs> um, and then, you know, what about all of these uh, all of these women? Um, and so I went through and I said, well, I already have, you know, about 40 pages written uh, on these women. Plus, I have all these notes uh, from uh um, from teaching on various women. Uh, and so I chatted with my colleague, Michelle, um, and we decided to go ahead and put a book proposal uh, together. Um, we decided to go with Academic Studies Press for a couple reasons. First of all, I did want to use the book um, as, a, uh, as a textbook in my class. So price point was very important to me. I didn't want to um, be charging most of the, the publishers we talked at had sort of like a $100 um, price point. <laughs> price point um, for um, the hardback version and then maybe a, a softback version would come out that would be accessible to students. This was a very quick way to make it accessible to students and plus they also gave us the option of, uh, of working with a Russian publisher uh, to get it out in uh, Russian. Uh, so I think that was a uh, um, uh, you know important to us. I think um, in terms of you know how I um, sort of write and how I am inspired to write, I think that uh, one thing is that other voices, meaning other books, uh, really, uh, inspire. Right. Um, just in my field, I think there are three books that have haven't influenced me uh, the most. Uh, David uh, McFadden's Yellow Crocodiles and Blue Oranges uh, came out in 2005. So it's a fairly sort of old book in, in uh, our field. Um, and he argues, of course, that um, socialist animation, the Soviet socialist animation between 1936 and 1999 was fundamentally emotional and not propagandistic. Um, uh, and, and so I, I really enjoy this book a lot, but I found that it was very difficult for my undergraduates um, to really get through large parts of it. Um, I assigned them small parts of it. Um, and when I'm writing, I definitely use his bibliography, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, uh, I I use this one as a way to sort of further my own work. And then we have Laura uh, Pontieri's uh, Soviet Animation and the Thaw from the 1960s, uh, not only for children, came out in 2012. Uh, and Laura draws a lot on ex extensive archival research. Um, she does concentrate her attention on animation for adults. Um, the, the sort of newly emerged Soviet animation of the 1960s. Uh, and um, she, anal she gives analysis, right, of the various factors um, that took a Russian animation for being, um, you know, sort of dedicated to children, right, during the Stalinist years to being a medium that addressed uh, the adult public. And one of the reasons that I really enjoy her work is she offers uh, a close analysis of many of the Thaw animated films uh, for adults. And I really like the way that she uncovers the sort of dissent, right, against the Soviet government uh, and demonstrates how individual artists began to demonstrate their own personal and subjective views on life. And I definitely think this book was very influential in my decision to write a book on Soviet animation because I enjoyed her approach so much that I wanted uh, there to be more of this type of research available to scholars, but also to my students. Um, and then finally, uh, Maya's book, right, um, which I'm sure that you all um, know. Um, this book has actually accompanied me on many research trips, <laughs> and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but now I'll stop to tell you a little anecdote. Maya, I don't remember exactly when. I'm guessing it was around 2014, but it might have been earlier. Um, you wrote me an email, and you asked me if I had a particular source on the Broombergs. And of course, I didn't. Um, I and, and uh, you know, I did eventually find it. Uh, 
at Leninka um, with the help of like two librarians because it was like impossible to find. I hope we eventually yes. um, found it too, but it was like Me too. <laughs> so hidden. It was like the most hidden thing ever. Um, but anyway, yeah. I did eventually um, find it. But one of the things that uh, you wrote to me in the email is, oh, we're, we're approaching things completely differently. And I was like, wow, do I even know how I'm approaching things? But it's interesting that these little, you know, comments from colleagues really help sort of shape the direction that you are going in, even when you don't realize, right, the direction um, that uh, you're going in. Because I'm not sure I knew my direction uh, back then uh, when I first uh, uh, got that uh, got that email. Um, but really, the, the reason that I uh, love this book and uh, keep it so close to me is the meticulous attention to detail and the well-constructed arguments make it a very important book for animation um, studies. And in fact, um, I, I just have to mention that uh, Maya's work on Cheborashka is definitely the most cited in my students' papers on animation. I mean, maybe they cite me a little more, but I'm teaching the class and I think they feel <laughs> like they should um, versus right? <laughs> All of the other readings that I, uh, I, I assign uh, in the class. Um, and I really wish that I had been able to um, reach this sort of meticulous uh, research uh, in She Animates. And I think I did fall a little bit um, uh, low on that. So um, our writing technique uh, for She Animates, I mean, how did we get out a co-authored um, book. I, I think, first of all, it's sort of unusual in the humanities, um, the way that we did it, right? It's not that it's a co-authored book, as in I wrote one chapter, Michelle wrote another chapter, right? It's not this type of co-authored book. Um, instead, we sort of integrated our writing uh, together, more maybe how scientists uh, uh, write, right? We, in this case, maybe assigned each other certain films uh, to watch. Uh, and Michelle and I also have very different writing approaches, but luckily our writing styles um, are, are similar. Um, at this point, when I open our book, um, I can't tell who wrote what. Uh, and we have sort of seamlessly integrated our work together. Um, in general, we uh, traveled together to Moscow to work in archives. Uh, unfortunately, we spent a lot less time there than um, I would have liked. Um, I think um, there's anything, like I said, large that I would change about the book. It was that I wish we had had more time uh, in uh, in the archives. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the archives uh, and uh, sort of the things that we encountered uh, there. So. Uh, for example, here is one of the archives that we visited. This is Gus Filmofond, right? Um, the State Film Archive uh, in Russia. And the archivists were more than happy to help us uncover um, the work of women. Um, but at the same time, they they sort of sort of looked at us in sort of an incredulous way. Why, why are you pulling all of this work um, on women? They also served us tea and cookies along with the archival uh, um, research, which is very, very different. If you go to Hollywood here um, in California and uh, go to the archives, right? You're made to wear gloves, you're issued certain pencils, right? Um, the archival uh, experience is uh, very different. Um, we worked in a bunch of different archives there, Sayus Multfilm, Argadi, uh, uh, the Library of Leninka. Uh, and like I said, we made two uh, different uh, two different uh, trips there. Um, Michelle actually spent an entire semester in Moscow, but she was working on another book. So our uh, research together was um, uh, her, I mean, her her research there was really on something else and not on our not on our book. Um, so uh, you know, and so I I mean that was very helpful to have her um, there because she could copy things, send things to me, um, uh, and it was nice to do that. Um, one of the other uh, sort of big um, uh, research uh, directions that that we used is the library at the University of Illinois Urbana. Champaign. They have a summer research lab uh, at the Russian and East European and Eurasian uh, Center. And the librarians there are just incredibly helpful. Um, the uh, 
the library there holds one of North America's largest contemporary uh, collections on contemporary and historical uh, materials uh, on this uh, period. Uh, and to make uh, research there even better, um, if you get a research a fellowship there, uh, they give you uh, free housing, they give you a stipend, they give you a travel grant. Um, while this in general is for US citizens, they do offer um, you know, there, there are ways for international scholars to also uh, receive these, uh, uh, these types of this type of help as well. And so the research trips to Russia uh, and to Illinois allow us a lot of face to face time uh, to work together and to write together, which I think was really instrumental in completing our project. Um, uh, because even though we did assign each other sort of certain films, um, uh, at the end, when we were synthesizing the work together, sitting face to face uh, made this type of work easier. We also met on Zoom to talk out our ideas. I've actually been maintaining a Zoom account since like 2017 or 2018, which meant when we all went into the pandemic, uh, I taught my entire department how to use it because at that point, nobody, uh, you know, uh, really knew that. Um, and I think the sort of final piece in how Michelle and I co-wrote in terms of the dynamics is that we have really very different uh, writing uh, styles. Um, I am sort of the type of writer that just wants to get something on paper. I just throw my ideas out and edit, edit, edit. I write fairly quickly. Um, and I'm also very much inspired by others, other writings, um, which is why I sort of mentioned the three books that I always keep on my, uh, about animation that I always keep on my desk. I'm always looking for something else to read. Michelle's approach to writing is more meticulous. She weighs out every word. She carefully crafts each footnote. Um, I'm constantly trying to find where I found a quote, right? So um, we just have very different approaches. Um, uh, and, you know, when I look at our book today, I can't really tell you who wrote what. I can usually tell you who started a section or who maybe uh, wrote the first uh, draft. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes I read something and I'm sure that she wrote it. She, she, she thinks I wrote it. Um, of course, not everyone has a, a friend in the field that they can work this way. Um, but I actually really do encourage this type of, of, of writing. Um, I know that maybe I'm I'm lucky in a way that you know if I were a uh, you know a, not a lecturer but a, a professor uh, here at the University of California um, they wouldn't have accepted this book as a book uh, because it was co-authored um, and so here in the United States it wouldn't have been helpful uh, to promotion. Uh, but I really think that's sort of a problem in the humanities that the scientists uh, don't face. You know, they are very much open to collaboration. Um, and uh, that, we, that we don't do this in the humanities, I think is actually, uh, uh, I think it actually sort of harms our, uh, our, you know, our scholarship. So anyway, this is uh, uh, my take on it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the thaw and uh, the Brezhnev stagnation period. Um, this is the chapter that I uh, shared with, uh, with Maya. Um, so, you know, when I first put together my uh, teaching, uh, my teaching syllabus for uh, the animation class, this film actually wasn't on it the first time I taught. Um, but I had become acquainted with this film um, when I was a, a, a graduate student teaching Russian at the University of California. And the Russian language program director at that point was in her 40s. Um, and she wanted um, our students uh, who were studying Russian to watch this film. <laughs> and she made sort of handouts of the songs uh, and she glossed them appropriately so students could sort of follow along because this is a musical, right? There's no, uh, the, everything is, uh, you know, the entire plot is carried by song. Um, and uh, I went along with the idea, of course, I was just a grad student, um, but I kept thinking to myself, A, this is really hard for students to understand. They're singing in sort of a stylized manner um, that is tough um, for beginning students of Russian to understand. 
Secondly, I couldn't really figure out why she was so taken by this animation. I it was sort of beyond me when and when I was that age. I I mean, I knew you know in the 1990s when I was a grad student, uh, The Simpsons right were a very popular animation for adults. Right, I was raised on here in the United States what we call Saturday morning cartoons. So I I didn't sort of um, find the animation at all the animation technique of it was fine for me. I was used to that sort of um, limited animation, right? Um, but I couldn't figure out, you know, why she was just so uh, uh, taken uh, by this uh, occult film. I, I just didn't see the appeal back then. But when I was, you know, redoing my syllabus, I remembered this cult-like attraction to this animation. Um, not only, of course, to my director, because over the years, I realized that a lot of Russian friends and a lot of their parents had this sort of attachment uh, to this film. And this is when I added it to uh, the syllabus. Um, but at first, I didn't really consider it part of women's cinema when I first taught it. I taught it as limited animation. I taught it as um, a, a musical, right, uh, uh, for children and a much broader audience. I taught it, uh, you know, I, I taught it as, you know, how it became sort of a cult film. But I never realized really or, or put two and two together that Inessa Kovalevskaya was was a woman, right? And so when I started to formulate my book project, this is where this uh, sort of um, came out. Now, I really wish that this film had been um, one that I had uh, been allowed to, I think I was supposed to enhance this, sorry. There we go. Um, I, I really wish that this film I had been allowed to do more or, or been able to do more archival research on. Unfortunately, we were uh, very limited and, and, and weren't able to do a lot on this particular film. However, I was able to locate a few re resources that were very help helpful in writing um, of this section. Um, and I think finding Kovalevskaya's own recollections of making the film uh, really gave me a lot of uh, insights um, that made that I think made the chapter a lot uh, um, uh, sort of more uh, interesting. Um, of course, when we were writing it, we were uh, most interested uh, in uh, how uh, this film is part of women's cinema, especially given its immense popularity uh, in the Soviet Union. Of course, you know, one of the very early premises we uh, worked with in the book was, you know, that women's cinema is just cinema made by women, right? So obviously, Inessa Kovalevskaya's film has to be part of um, women's cin cinema because she is a woman. Um, but we didn't want to obviously leave it just like that. And so I hope that you know our focus on the princess in this film and in sort of her non-traditional role, her non-traditional clothing, um, does prove that this is more uh, a part of women's cinema than just uh, Kovalevskaya uh, being uh, a, a woman. Um, and uh, one of the things that I, I focus on uh, in the in the chapter is that, you know, she recalls in her memoir that it was very difficult to work on the character development, the images, right, of these um, characters, especially for the troubadour and the princess, right? And the artist had come up with, with uh, the sort of first sketches for the main characters. And I'm going to show them to you because this is uh, something that I didn't get permission to uh, put in my book. So um, they are aren't uh, there. Um, but I think it's interesting to take a look at these uh, at these images and, you know, imagine what this film would have been like, right, if uh, we had had these characters for the princess uh, and the uh, and the troubadour. I think that, uh, you know, it would have been a very, very uh, different film. I mean, to me, they're they're much more clown-like, right? Than uh, what ends up uh, in in the film. Um, and of course, I wrote about this in the chapter, but I'm still amazed, uh, you know, at what Kovalevskaya um, was able uh, to do. That because she had worked earlier as an actual censor, right, uh, on other uh, animations, she. Then when saw these uh, these drawings, she said, "Oh, this is not what we want, right?" And so she brought it to the artist uh, to the art council uh, and and asked, "No, this isn't what we want, right?" And she got them on uh, on board and uh, was able to change them, right, to uh, what we're what we're used to. Uh, what we Laura, what we, yes, uh, you have a question from Miriam oh, Reiner. Sorry. 
No, I'm no, sorry. that's okay. I just, that's why I'm stepping in. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah, no, she is, I guess not everyone's familiar with the film. And that's one thing that I really found is that, that is that like the, the most iconic Soviet films, like, you know, are like Mickey Mouse over there and nobody outside of the nobody, Soviet Union. Nobody there. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so Mickey, I should go, yeah. go back a little bit and tell a little bit more about it, right? Yeah. So um, this uh, is a uh, film, it is a musical, right? About a, a, a group of wandering musicians right, uh, who uh, wander to a, a castle, right, where they meet a princess, right, and, uh, you know, they, of course, as you would imagine, fall in love, right, and uh, I mean, I'm telling this very quickly, they fall in love, and while you would expect, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, they would maybe follow, you know, they would stay there and become, right, prince and princesses or together or something like this, she runs away with the uh, musicians, Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the 1960s, this was a, sort of a, a very, uh, well, I mean, it, it didn't show necessarily what you would consider to be good Soviet uh, um, morals, right, to be running off with um, musicians, right? And, uh, and so, you know, in this way, it, it became uh, very much a, a cult film, I think a lot because of the music, Right. Um, but also, you know, the the look of the characters, if I just switch this right, was very, very uh, sort of topical. Right. For uh, the 1960s. Right. They have this kind of hippie look to them. Right. Uh, and uh, um, Kovalevskaya said that, you know, they basically went to she went to the archives and she um, started looking through these foreign journals. Right. To basically try to find a, a look for these uh, um, for these characters. And this is what she found. And she was sort of amazed that she was able to get it through the censors uh, because uh, in reality, it was a very Western look, right? And she said that it, it was really just, uh, she just didn't expect that she would be able to get it through, right? And I think when adults watch this film, um, one of the things that they are, are were taken with back then in the 1960s is what they were able to do in a children's film because it was a children's film. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry, is that better? So good. So, Okay, just making sure. <laughs> yeah, um, and so this is one of the things I, I'm so taken with uh, with this particular um, th this particular uh, film is that you know she was able to make this sort of radical change from what to me looks like I would suppose um, just uh, typical maybe children's right prince and uh, princess or okay he's not a prince he's the traveling uh, vagabond right um, and the princess to right what looks like modern uh, 1960s inspired Beatles right type uh, um, um, uh, wear right and so um, and I think one of the things I, I definitely want to make clear is that you know I, by a final anecdote uh, about this film and, and why I think it's so important that we sort of reclaim other voices in Soviet animation like female directors is that I was at a, a birthday party for a neighborhood child and I was talking to another parent of a child who happened to be Russian and we started talking uh, about my book project and he sort of wondered out loud he said I wonder if I've actually seen any uh, films uh, by uh, Russian women directors and I said yeah of course because you know almost all Russian have seen this film, um, The Musicians of Bremen. And he looked at me and he said, well, no. And he pulls out his cell phone to prove me wrong, to say, oh no, that's a very famous uh, male director. Let me pull it up. And he pulled it up uh, and he was like, uh, he was shocked. He had no idea um, that Kovalevskaya was a woman. I think mainly because the, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, songs are so famous um, that people conflate uh, the composer, right, of the songs and the singer of the songs um, with the animation, right? But it's a, another way in which, you know, women's voices in, in animation uh, become erased, right? Um, and also and so the art director, that, Laura, the yes. art director is currently a chassid living in Israel. <laughs> oh, that is very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so lots of uh, lots of uh, connections, uh, uh, connections there. Yeah, um, 
did I make mistakes when writing this? I absolutely did. And you can't see this, unfortunately. I, I cropped this a little wrong. Let me see if I can go back to the other one. Oh, well, no, you can't really see it here either. And this is my point, right? Did I make mistakes in writing this book? I actually made probably a lot. But one of the ones that drives me crazy um, that I made um, when we were working on the trans, with the, you know, on the translation of the book, um, we were working with a translator who pointed out that the princess is not wearing boots. She's wearing shoes with high socks. Now, of course, do they kind of look like boots? Yes, but are they boots? No. <laughs> so, you know, I guess this is another thing, right? We write and then we hope that someone else uh, comes back and fixes our mistakes. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, obviously this is, uh, you know, one of, of my mistakes. Um, so how did I start writing about Ukrainian animation? I have to say that this is a new project, something that I am just getting started um, on. Um, one of our reviewers from uh, She Animates, um, Malcolm Cook, sorry, I think I'm supposed to be moving on here. Um, from the University of Southampton in the UK, um, asked us, uh, asked me, sorry, to uh, write a chapter on geography on on, uh, on Soviet animation post World War II Soviet animation, um, for a book uh, called Geographies and Histories, uh, and of uh, of animation. And so, of course, he wants something new, something that hasn't been done before. Uh, and I really started out to do just this. I mean, I was told, uh, you know, post. Uh, World War II animation in the Soviet Union. Um, and so, you know, I think it was really the war in Ukraine that led me down a different path. Um, one that I'm not sure I'm completely uh, authoritatively approaching, um, but I do think it's very important. Um, I think one of the things we talked about a lot here uh, in the United States when uh, the war first started is that, uh, you know, one thing that this really means is that scholars really need to work to uncover these critical, um, these uncritical biases that have been sort of uh, very too long overlooked in the study of uh, the Soviet Union. Um, works of literature, music, right, cinema, all need to be re-examined under sort of a more critical lens uh, to reveal the sort of national trends that were labeled Soviet or even more inappropriately, maybe Russian, right? And I think that even when I sort of think about my past work, especially in my teaching, when I'm teaching um, uh, undergraduates, I often just say, oh, this is Soviet, right? And I and I leave it uh, at that. Um, and I, I don't necessarily distinguish if a director was Armenian or Ukrainian, right? I just say that it was Soviet. Um, so with this invited chapter that I was pitched, right, post-World War II uh, Soviet animation, I decided that really I, what I needed to do was being do a better job at uncovering more national animation, right? More of these other voices um, that we may have just called Soviet. Um, so I do hope that this, this work, this chapter that I'm writing um, will address some of the ways in which uh, Ukraine under Soviet control have been fighting this uh, Russian uh, he hegemony right during the second half of uh, the 20th century. Um, I do think, you know, looking at uh, Ukrainian animation, I think that, I think that uh, Ukrainian and Russian animation have some similar trajectories. Uh, I can't say how much of this at this point was forced uh, on uh, Ukraine, <laughs> uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what I have discovered or uncovered so far. Um, uh, and, and I did go back sort of, even though I've been tasked with uh, doing, um, you know, um, post-World War II, I did start back at the beginning to really better understand the trajectory uh, of the animation field in Ukraine. Um, and I think one of the things that started to stand out to me very early on, um, uh, when I first started looking at the animation in the 1960s, uh, was that the animations were in Russian and not Ukrainian, right? So that started me thinking, well, you know, oh, 
what's going on here, right? What what is happening? Um, so, uh, and I don't have data necessarily on you know how many animations at what time were in Ukrainian and how many at what time were in Russian. Um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I have found um, so far. So the All Ukrainian Photo uh, Cinema Administration in Ukraine was established in 1922 under the National Commissar of Education uh, uh, of the Ukrainian SSSR. And um, as uh, in Russia, right, a directive uh, in April of 1922 brought all movie theaters and photographic industries and film industries located in Ukraine under this administration. Uh, and uh, Vyacheslav uh, Lewandowski uh, is really considered the father of, or the grandfather maybe, of Ukrainian animation. He was born um, in Kiev. He began, like a lot of uh, you know animators, began in other fields, maybe not related at all to uh, animation. He began to study uh, physics and chemistry, but then transferred uh, to the Kiev Theater Academy in 1918, and then studied studio painting at the Ukrainian Academy of arts. Um, while he was still a student, he painted scenery for theaters, he illustrated children's books. Uh, and uh, in 1921 to 1923, when the famine hit Kiev, uh, he moved with other students um, to the Arts and Ceramics College in a little village. Um, and it was after he graduated in 1923 that he took a position as an artist at the All Ukrainian Photo and Cinema Administration in Odessa and began to work on educational and technical uh, animation shorts for live action film. Um, and it was in 1926, so just a few years uh, later, Oh, I'm on the right slide, a few years later, um, when he proposed to open uh, the first Ukrainian animation workshop uh, in Odessa. Um, interestingly enough, because I wrote on Ziga Vertov, um, that uh, uh, Lev uh, Lewandowski used the notes of Alexander Bushkin, a uh, Ukrainian who had worked on Ziga Vertov's Soviet toys, uh, to, to start his own uh, animation um, section. He read his notes, right, to try to figure out how he did it, um, to learn out sort of the basics of cutout animation. Um, and he put together this uh, workshop where he sort of handcrafted the camera himself uh, and uh, he made an animation uh, stand out of wood and obviously very uh, various optics. Um, and so early Ukrainian animation, um, like early Russian animation, was often made on adult themes. However, the one uh, the you know the earliest um, Ukrainian animation that is often mentioned the most, right, the tale. Um, of the straw bull uh, is a Ukrainian folk tale, right? So the very first one um, was uh, was was for I mean could have been for children. Um, it's lost, so we can't see it. There's a still here from um, it. The next two uh, animations that they turned out um, ten years came out in 1927, uh, and it was a propaganda film that used animation to di diagram the accomplishments of the Soviet government for the first ten years, uh, and then. Um, uh, but but this was also uh, never screened, also lost today. I don't even have any uh, um, uh, any slot. I mean any um, stills from it, right? And then finally, uh, Ukrainization from 1927. Um, this was also by uh, Lewandowski, and this was about the adoption of the Ukrainian language, right? And so this was right up sort of my uh, thinking of like, well, what's going on here with Ukrainian and uh, Russian? Um, and it was about, like I said, the adoption of the Ukrainian language in official institutions uh, in Ukraine. The interesting thing is that when you start to look this film up uh, on various uh, sites, um, there there is a press record as if it has been screened. Um, but there's no record to necessarily whether or not it was screened. So there's a little bit of a unknown uh, situation here. Um, the press though, uh, so we I figured it was at least screened once. The press, uh, you know, uh, praised the, his work and the skill of his animation, um, but the, the film did run into trouble because of the changing climate about 
the Ukrainian language. Um, so the policy of uh, uh, Ukrainianization, if I have that right in English, <laughs> was part of the early years of the Soviet Union. It's usually from about 1923 to 1931, but those end dates are very flexible, as you can see, because this film was from 1927. Um, the first years, at least, the Soviets were more worried about political opposition, right, than to Ukrainian national um, movements. And so in a way, at least the first years of those uh, 1920s, Ukrainian culture enjoyed a, sort of a little more of a renaissance. Um, for example, even if you look at, at at dates from as laid out as 1931, if you look at uh, movie, uh, I mean, theaters, um, 88 theaters were, um, were uh, you know, doing... Uh, uh, were showing in Ukrainian, 66, uh, I'm sorry, 88 were in Ukrainian, uh, no, sorry, there were 88 total, 88 total theaters, 66 were in Ukrainian, 12 were in Yiddish, right, and only nine were in Russian, so, you know, you can kind of see what, uh, you know, people, the languages that people were uh, using at that time, the number of Ukrainian papers um, which almost didn't exist, newspapers almost didn't exist in 1922, had reached 373 out of 426 um, by 1931. Uh, and there were only three large Russian papers at that um, period. And if you look at that period also, if you want to look at the schools, um, the Soviet-backed educational system drastically ra raised the literacy of Ukrainian phone rural populations um, during this time period. And by 1929, over 97% of uh, school students in um, the sort of outlying regions uh, were obtaining their education in Ukrainian. So um, at least in these early years, it, it seems that Ukrainian was uh, encouraged or at least um, not discouraged directly. Um, however, starting definitely in the 1930s, right, at the beginning of the 30s, the Ukrainization policies were reversed, and these policies were declared to be the primary problem in Ukraine. Usually the major repression is marked to 1929 and 1930, um, with the sort of peak happening during 1933, during the great uh, Ukrainian famine. Um, but, I mean, this film is from 1927, uh, about the adoption of Ukrainian language. And we also know that from the press reports that, um, you know, he was accused of avant-garde experiments, right, because the film was uh, uh, made of abstract construction. I don't know. I mean, I look at the things here. They don't look so abstract to me, but, you know, um, yeah. Um, so and the film was eventually banned for its national orientation of, and was considered harmful. Um, so I mean, we can see that, you know, one thing that is for sure uh, uh, is that Ukrainian animation was strangled by Moscow, right, from from very early uh, on. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, World War II, right, uh, animation and what's going on uh, post uh, uh, World War II. Um, so one of the things that happens in Russian uh, animation is that uh, the sort of trend towards Russian national content, right, happened in post uh, World War II um, Russian animation, um, and it, it happened in Ukrainian animation uh, as well. I, I think this definitely coincided um, with the Soviets' decision to export more animated films to Eastern European countries, um, as well as sort of this idea that they wanted to compete, that the Soviet Union wanted, wanted to compete with the West um, during the Cold War. Um, of course, in Ukraine, um, just like in Russia, after Stalin's death, right, uh, Ukraine really wanted to establish a new founding narrative. Uh, they wanted to, uh, in order to popularize this uh, sort of new narrative, uh, Ukraine produced new publications on the communist revolution in Ukraine and sort of rewrote their early communist party history. They, of course, rehabilitated Ukrainian communists um, who had fallen victim to repressions, um, and death, right? And constructed a set of uh, monuments that sort of embodied this new hysterical, historical paradigm. Um, and these uh, sort of efforts uh, aimed at de-Stalinization, right? Um, also helped promote Soviet 
Ukrainian uh, patriotism um, so that Ukrainians would feel more part of the Soviet whole. Um, in terms of Ukrainian animation, it, it was reborn after uh, uh, World War II. Um, there was an, establish, uh, an establishment of a new uh, animation workshop um, led by Ipalit um, Lazarchuk, uh, Irina Guvrich, and uh, Nina uh, Valisenko. Um, no more women, right, um, who were working in Ukrainian uh, animation. And Kiev uh, Na uh, Nauk Film established itself in uh, Ukraine uh, in uh, January of 1941. So right as the war was um, starting, um, as you can imagine, they first, I mean, they first, I should say, they first produced um, popular science uh, films or you know, small bits that would be used in other uh, films. Uh, um, and then during the war, they were evacuated to Tashkent. They eventually returned to Kiev uh, in uh, 1944, but they remained sort of dormant until the 1950s. Um, uh, but uh, once they got going, right, in the late 50s, uh, Kiev uh, Nauk Film uh, um, worked until 1998. They made over 300 films, um, mainly shorts, um, usually for television. Um, and the Ukrainian School of Animation uh, sort of established their own techniques, their own styles and themes um, that I, I think really helped um, their films push the boundaries of both Soviet and um, world animation even though we maybe don't think so much about Ukrainian uh, animation. Um, Ukrainian animators, um, like Russian animators at the time, really refused to imitate Disney. Um, they rejected Disney's naturalistic styles. They really did search for their own um, sort of styles uh, that were founded in the strength of indiv individual um, artists. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the adventures of uh, Pepper. Um, this uh, was uh, so uh, this uh, this uh, the animator uh, Ipalit Lazarchuk uh, and Irina um, uh, Huvrich. Uh, she uh, so he originally trained as a classical painter um, at the Kiev Art Institute and then worked as an assistant director before um, the war at the Ukrainian studio of news, uh, real and documentary film. Uh, and uh, after this, uh, after the war, he uh, co-directed uh, the probably most famous post-war animations, The Adventures of Pepper, which came out in 1960. Um, uh, Hurvich uh, gra uh, graduated, excuse me, from the Kiev Art Institute as well. Um, but she spent her first years working at the uh, Davidenko uh, Film Studio and then joined Kiev uh, Nauk Film, um, where she formed this animation workshop um, with Lazarchu. Um, and um, in Ukraine in the 19 or the late 1950s, um, there were no special uh, animation schools, um, but uh, uh, Hudrich, like many women uh, animators, came became involved in passing down um, her his her ideas to younger uh, animators. So this film, The Adventures of Peppers from 1960s, was based on a satirical journal called Pepper. I have some of them there. Um, the the magazine ran from 1941 into 2000, and it was controlled by the Communist Party of Ukraine. Um, however, while the tool while, while it was a tool of the Communist Party, the humor really served as a way to undermine the power structure right of the Soviet government at the same time. Um, in this animated film, uh, the hero. Karatun is a man, a man with a pepper head, right? You see him here um, sitting on uh, this, uh, this magazine. Um, and um, he, you know, he is an, a magazine employee. He fights bureaucrats and poachers who are trying to uh, ruin uh, the forest and ruin the water. Um, and this animation, I think, distinguishes itself actually from Russian animation of the same time period. Um, because of course it does emphasize Ukrainian dress, Ukrainian language, but also the grotesque, right? This pepper guy is a, a little unusual um, for, uh, for the time period. Um, I think the very opening of The Adventure of Pepper may remind viewers of Disney animation. And I think, um, that, you know the the introduction of of this pepper 
man uh, is even more shocking because of this, right? So the opening scenes um, is these are these birds playing music on uh, music on string instruments, trombone, flute, right? Rabbits and bears are dancing to the music. Um, there's sort of a, a Disney-esque um, locker room joke humor. There's a fisherman who gets his stuck his his hook stuck on his rear end, right? And then when he finally fishes something out, he fishes out tins that had fish in them instead of actual fish, right? Um, uh, but, you know, the other sort of interesting things of the adventure of Pepper is that it is for adults, right? Because, you know, he is part of uh, Karatun, the, the main character, is part of the editorial staff for the satirical uh, magazine Pepper, and he springs into action uh, to help uh, uh, these inhabitants of the local forest uh, and river. He finds out that there are these negligent factory managers who are not only drinking and driving, they're poaching, killing animals, um, um, but they're also letting their factories pollute the, the local river that are then, it's, you know, spilling into the forest um, as well. Um, and, you know, the, the, the managers also have these sort of um, you know, they demonstrate a lot of um, uh, moral personal failings as well. They become drunk. They can't distinguish a deer from a dog. Um, even the child, you know, even the child of the uh, of the managers uh, starts a forest fire, right? Yes. And the animals have to come uh, and uh, put the fire um, out. Um, and of course, it's uh, Pepper who then is this yeah pepper who then uses his broom and sort of cleans everything up including the forest he sweeps away um the uh um the the managers right uh and uh puts everything back in order um uh so you know I think while this, I think one of the things to point out that be, that became so interesting me interesting to me is that while this animation is in Russian, um, the Ukrainian is there right? It is um, in a way sort of um, politically charged. Ukrainian is used in sort of all the written communication, right? Hence the warning sign about no hunting in the forest is in Ukrainian, right? And when uh, Karatun the pair the 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 uh, the pepperhead visits uh, the hospital, right? It's in Ukrainian. When the bear takes uh, anti-anxiety medicine, when he realizes he's being um, poached, it's in Ukrainian, right? Um, and so, you know, obviously, you know, there is this sort of nod to Ukrainian, even though the film is is uh, uh, is in um, Russian. So that raises a lot of questions about, you know, what's uh, going on with Ukrainian in uh, the 1960s. And, and although, you know, in 1958, um, the Soviet Union Parliament passed a law that sort of removed uh, the provisioning stating that children of non-Russian families were to be educated in their native language and allowing parents to choose the language of instructions. But the problem was that, you know, most universities teachings uh, were teaching in Russian at that point, highly paid jobs and official positions were really open mainly to Russian speakers, right? Um, and so I think, you know, these types of things made, you know, uh, made Ukrainian not as popular. So if we look in like 1959 in Kyiv, um, only 23% were being taught in Ukrainian, whereas 73% were being taught uh, in Russian. Uh, uh, and so I think that I, I suppose the reason that Adventure of Pepper, right, is in Russian with Ukrainian, uh, uh, you know, uh, signs is really understandable given the language politics um, of the time. Obviously, a lot more research has to be done in this area. I am still working on it, um, but I hope that gives you a view into my writing process uh, and uh, what I'm working on now. <laughs> Thank you so much. And see you guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have a, I have a few uh, a few things that I I want to say, but I want to first open it up just to see if, if any questions had come up during, and if not, um, then then I'll go so everyone has a chance to think. Uh, does anyone have a question? Comments. Okay, good. So I'm gonna go first. So thank thank you so much for discussing the processes. Um, uh, I remember one time, like, okay, sorry, I'm not sure where to start. Um, 
it makes sense to me that you can study um, gender. Oh, Marianne raised her hand. Sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, Marianne, wonderful. Go, and then I'll formulate. Oh, it's okay. You can start. I mean, uh, so thank you. It was really interesting. I have a um, question regarding the, if you could please go back to the musicians of Rema. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the princess and the troubadour. So if yeah. you go back, I have a question regarding the numbers. Uh huh. Uh, maybe we can see again the yeah, slide. Yeah, hold on one second. Let me, I unshared, but maybe that was a bad idea. <laughs> uh. Let's hold on one sec. Let me share again. Let's hope I can share better this time and with more authority. Okay. Are we sharing? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Let me just get find the uh, uh, number uh, here. Yeah. The numbers on them. I mean, I, I am not 100% sure uh, what uh, the numbers are. My, my feeling is that it's color. You have to color. click on the slide. Click on the slide that you want us to see. Oh, you don't see it? No, because it's 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 um just click on the slide that you want us to see. Okay, well, let me try again because I'm not doing it right. Okay. Oh yeah, here we go. I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Yep, we're getting there. Sorry, I went the wrong way. Okay. My my feeling is it's color. Yeah. But I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, no, it is. Right, so 2023, 20, right? To me, this is like color markings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so giving the, um, I, I mean, this is just done in pencil, right? But to give the, uh, the, the, the viewer sort of the idea of what it would look like, what, because, you know, when, when animation is created, um, it is this sort of um, tailorization, right? Where one person does the drawing right, the original drawing, then they pass it on to someone else who will, um, you know, you know, they, back then it was done on um, cells, right, so clear pieces of plastic, right, mm -hmm. where they would uh, draw on each of the uh, clear pieces of plastic, the moving parts, right, and then, you know, the moving parts could be, uh, you know, various hands, right, moving, and so uh, they would also go to what was called, uh, well, in English called the color key department that would actually do the coloring in, and they would also, uh, there would be a different department that would do the sort of outlines, right, so it was, mm -hmm. it was done in sort of this very tailored, so the original artist here is giving giving the, the color key department uh, a, a guide of how he thinks they should look, mm -hmm. right? Oh, because the, the, yeah. the, the artists themselves would have the sort of, you know, there was one main artist who, who, who would do the, uh, uh, the, the image drawing, but then because everyone else then had a chance, right, to do a little part, he wanted to pass on as much information as possible. Yeah, okay, thank you. These are uh, sure colors. Uh, 23 is yellow, for example. Oh, thank you. I don't have my glasses on, so reading them on the side is hard. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's not written, but uh, we, we can guess this and we can yes. guess each uh, number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful slide. <laughs> yeah, this says Krasny right here. Yeah. Oh, no, Krasny. Okay, sorry. I should put my glasses on for this. Outline. <laughs> yeah. Uh, gray outline and red right, gray outline. outline right here. Well, I don't know if you can but, see where I'm pointing. But, but anyway. uh, feeling, uh, it's, uh, yeah. uh, feeling is color, uh, colors and then mm -hmm. the numbers are the numbers of the colors. Of the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. So so if you want, you can click out so you can see all of us. Oh, so we can... Yeah. Sorry. Uh, unless yeah. someone else is going to ask me then. <laughs> Oh, unless somebody else has right a question. Back. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, so um, so let me try formulating again. Okay, so so I think that I read your book and I loved it, as you know. Um, and I think that a study could be done of uh of women in the animation industry as a separate category of study, just like Jews as a separate category of study. Mm -hmm. And one time I was asked actually to do this long encyclopedia entry on Jewish women in Soviet animation. And it was not, okay, after like, it has to be women and they have to be Jewish and Soviet. And it was that research 
it was like genealogical, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, yeah, and that's what you have to do. Right. I, I'm like, we should just DNA test them, you know, it was like ridiculous. We'll make our ridiculous. jobs easier. <laughs> no, but I really thought that it was an artificial um, category, like Jewish women. Uh-huh. Yeah. But I don't, but having said that, I don't think you could step, like, like I'm very taken by this, like recent desire to separate Ukrainian in Soviet mm-hmm. right. when it comes to Jewish animators or artists. And mm-hmm. everyone you showed us, Bush, Ginzi Gewerta, Lewandowski, right, right. Gervin, mm-hmm. they're all Jewish. They're, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So like reclaiming their Ukrainian, yeah. uh, you know, nationality. Right. I'm not saying Jews didn't use their Ukrainian nationality. No, yeah, of in course. very specific ways. Yeah. And not to mention the Jewish part almost feels like like it's the other way. Do, do you know what right, I'm saying? Right. That if you if you don't mention that, then you are going down the wrong path. And I think and I think you might be. I think that that is probably correct. I think that needs to be uh, mentioned as well. I think that I ended up sort of attracted to films that were really talking about Ukrainian language, right? Or had pieces of Ukrainian language in there. Um, but you're right. You're right. I think it, that does have to be mentioned. But it's yeah. not that it has to be mentioned. It's that the analysis of that would be very different. Jews it would be very Ukrainian different. Language. It would be incredibly different. You're right. You're right. So I, so I'm asked, like, I'm just asking if like, that's yeah. part of your analysis. Um, I mean, and, it should and be. what you think it's- about it. Yeah, it should be part of my analysis. It definitely should be part of my analysis and something I'm definitely going to uh, um, think more about. When I'm in the actual chapter, I also, you know, uh, you know, the Snow Queen, which is another famous, um, um, you know, animation from the 1960s is, uh, uh, is, you know, the director is actually Armenian. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of sort of, you know, situations here. And I think there's many different levels. And of course, you know, in one chapter, you can't approach all of them, but you can certainly mention it, right? With this sort of very, you know, with with the reason that you are doing a particular approach. Yes, but even Does that there, sense? Atamanov, yeah. yes, but even yeah. there, the Atamanov, who is the right. the, the who, who who you're call who you're calling the Armenian director. First right. of all, he, so many people told me that he's Jewish. By the way, really? I never. That's yeah, I don't. That, that so I, I don't never, know. I know. No, no, yeah, I don't know either. I don't, I don't know, know. No, it's so no, hard I, to know, though. I mean, how would you point figure is, that is out? Like, well, it's because he worked almost wholly with Jewish film teams, yeah. right? And, so maybe and Armenian uh, was almost like a token Jew <laughs> in some ways. Like they, like yeah. they, they were in. Right. His um, first animations were in Armenian, though. That's the. I mean, right. Yeah. No. So no. He was with Armenian. There's right, no question. Yeah. Armenian. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So thank you for 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 uh for giving us so much of your process because what uh um, I mean maybe that's not what you wanted, but I when I started yeah, writing, yeah. I was like, uh this feels right. <laughs> yeah, no. We have we have that idea of the researcher's desk um to be something that that people talk about their process as well. But while you were talking and and and, and uh, sharing your processes, I I was thinking about how interesting it is that so many uh, people in the creative fields um, in the Soviet Union left these kind of process notes, mm-hmm. left kind of career memoirs, film memories, and they mm-hmm. spoke very much like you do. And yeah. I really appreciate that. Because yeah. maybe I've read too many of them. <laughs> 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 Maybe I'm influenced just in that way too. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but it's 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 like a genre specific to uh these it kind is. of like socialist uh industries that you know uh that's that's different than in the States where where, where they yeah. really talk about like their directors groups. They yeah, do. They so. talk about the directors groups and they say, you know, who's dating who sometimes and like, you know, all this really weird details that you're like, I don't know if I needed to know that. <laughs> absolutely yeah okay so does anyone have any um comments for laura or questions yeah there's a couple up here uh hannah i think yeah. your hand up first okay 
Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, my question is also about the um, Bremer Stadtmusikanten. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and I was uh, a bit surprised because, as you mentioned, the plot it is vaguely based on the German fairy tale story. Vaguely, yeah, I can talk <laughs> about that, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. and I was wondering how far the German uh, GDR history is playing into that, also into the Western looks, um, to give something to the German public from the Soviet um, movie industry. You know, it it could be. I have to say that this is, I mean, this is one of the films that I wish I had been able to do a lot more research in the archives, um, but I don't have any background on that information. I know that they chose this film uh, because uh, they wanted to do a musical. And so they wanted to choose a uh, a film that A, hadn't already been done before and had some sort of um, music connection right, to make the musical um, more, but I haven't done any research on, for example, what the, what the response was in, right, uh, in, in Eastern, uh, 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 yeah, in, I, in Germany, I just have no idea, unfortunately, but it is a really interesting question. I was wondering, I think back in my head, I remember there's an early DEFA, which is a German GDR film production, also a early version of a Bremer Stadtmusikanten, yeah, uh -huh. and how far that might be. Um, maybe this is of interest to you. I don't know, do you know if it, it's a musical? I don't. I haven't seen it, so I'm I'm learning something today. I doubt it's a musical because it's yeah. very in GDR history. Right, but right, yeah. Maybe yeah. this is something interesting to you. For yeah, you. no, it's something very, very interesting, yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much for the talk. Yeah, thank you for your, yeah. Sorry, I don't have more information on that, but it is one of the films that I, I really wanted to get more information about. And we were just, we had so little time. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hilia? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And you uh, uh, spoke about different and so important and fascinating subjects. So uh, I have maybe a couple of uh, notes of uh, huh? on, uh, each of them, but uh, let me start with Bremenski Musicante and the Western part, the Western part of, of this story and this yeah. uh, and this film. Uh, the uh, uh, German uh, fairy tale uh, uh, or uh, folklore uh, was deeply adopted in uh, Russian language uh, children literature. So it was not seen as a, a foreign alien or even German in spite of the name of uh, German uh, town of Bremen. So it was uh, very local. Uh, now, I think uh, the uh, memoirs of Kovalevskaya blurs uh, the uh, uh, real sources of, of this artistic language because what they did, they it was their response, response of small group of young and mm -hmm. brave people to yeah. the yellow submarine that appeared just a year before. And the yellow submarine is here as a key. It's uh, uh, psychedelic colors and uh, in, in the, the final version and the uh, right. hippie culture and uh, uh, rock uh, musical uh, that was absolutely new in Soviet culture. And it was uh, 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 adopted, even not adopted, uh, but presented at, as something uh, local. It's not American. It's nothing. It's not a yellow submarine. It's ours. It's Soviet. It's not Russian. It's Soviet. So uh, uh, now about the uh, dichotomy of Ukrainian and Russian. Yeah. I think uh, we uh, should be very careful about uh, 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 drawing uh, or uh, uh, Project, projecting uh, our uh, today uh, concept on the uh, Soviet history. I think the uh, process of Ukrainization, not I think, it's it's, it's fact, 
the process of Ukrainization was really a part of much general uh, uh, politics, Soviet politics, politics of Karenizatsiya or going to the roots uh, that mm -hmm. was uh, that was implemented in each Soviet republic, right. whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was not uh, specific for, for Ukraine. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we are speaking here about the uh, Ukrainian national consciousness or mm -hmm. self-identification. Not there, not in, in the uh, paper. Uh, such uh, like uh, paper uh, magazines were in almost each Soviet oh, Republic okay. and they were just a copy of the Central Soviet uh, 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 magazine Crocodile. Right. Uh -huh. Just Ukrainian Crocodile. So right. I uh -huh. the, uh, here we, we have uh, local Ukrainian right. versus Soviet and not Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more about uh, universal and local than really national, right. uh -huh, I uh -huh. think. And uh, uh, maybe one mm -hmm. more note about uh, the uh, gender aspect of, of, of your research. I think it's... Uh, uh, Maybe very helpful to think about uh, Kovalevskaya in the uh, uh, context of uh, uh, Soviet uh, uh, women uh, film uh, directors, and we have really uh, very very great, uh, great team of of, of uh, such uh, women, and they were very famous. And uh, uh, I think uh, here it was not something usual there. Right. Mm -hmm. yes, so I think here we, we can understand better uh, her role in, in this innovation if you think about uh, other uh, women who did something uh, sim similar or mm -hmm. turning to very... Uh, new subjects in 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 in, in films in, in cinema mm -hmm. um, and uh, what is really very interesting is that the ukrainian uh, animation of the 60s and 70s maybe was even more western oriented than the soviet uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, animation films that the examples that you showed it's it's Disney. It's just uh, uh, dynamics uh, and the movements of 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 of, of, of uh, characters there and uh, the rhythm uh, of of the uh, films and the characters and the, the uh, style of the characters are much more Disney than uh, the production of uh, Soyuz Multifilm, for example, of the Central uh, Animation Studies, uh, uh, studies uh, studios. Okay, so it's, oh, thank uh, you. Yes. so thank you, thank you for um, very, uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, questions and uh, uh, directions of thought. Yeah, no, thank you for all of those comments. You've definitely made me think about some things that uh, I uh, I haven't uh, uh, thought and made some notes. So hopefully this will help me to uh, uh, think about uh, these uh, these uh, films in more nuanced uh, ways. And I think that uh, that's that's very it's very helpful. So thank you. Okay, um, does anyone else have a question or comment? Okay, <laughs> Ilya, could I, I know I'm, I, I'm not supposed to follow up on Ilya's question, but I'm just very curious. What, Ilya, do you, are you saying that Ukrainian animation was more, dis, you found a, uh, Ukrainian Disney animation to be yeah. more Disney-esque than Sayuz Bond film, which had yes, so many yes, Ukrainian yes. artists. Until Nupogadi. Wow, I have to think about that, but yeah, well, I have to think about it too. It's, it's uh, Eternal Tom and Jerry. No, yes, but 
Yeah. yeah, but what Ukrainian studios were in operation in the 40s and 50s that there, there weren't, weren't part of Soyuz Nord film? Yeah. We don't. Yeah. It is something else. Uh, I think that uh, it's, uh, any, any, any provincial study uh, studios uh, felt themselves more free in uh, artistic experiments than the central mm -hmm. studies, uh, studios. And the same is about the universities in Gold for Second, Tartu, for example, yes, mm -hmm. that was uh, leading uh, non Soviet university in the Soviet Union. And okay. who well, knew you. where is Tartu? Yeah is or also I mean, I... on and i think i think this or armenian uh, films uh, were much uh, more innovative than the films uh, made in moscow so, so yeah okay so you're saying that a farther away from the central is where yeah. they did okay just making sure i think i misunderstood you at yes. one point but yeah okay um, that's, the that's, 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 I would agree. Yeah, yeah. 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 I have to think more about it than being more Disney like. I that wasn't my first impression, but like I said, I'm I'm just starting down this path. So um I might discover that uh, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it was a real honor having you. And uh, and yeah, and you gave me a lot to think about also. And Ilya also, thank you for those uh, comments. I also am taking mental notes. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I can't wait to hear great things from you, Laura. <laughs> I'm so waiting sorry for this. I took more call. time than, uh, than given. So I'm sorry about that if I ran over. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.